I do not have any disclosures, but the presentation comes with a warning. It does contain some graphic images, foul smelling and bloody pathologic conditions, which may not be suitable for non-radiologists. So assuming they're all radiologists here. All right. Uh, objectives, uh, I'm going to review the causes of acute scrotal pain. I'm going to omit on the basic anatomy, assuming everybody is aware of the testicular and epididymal anatomy. We'll learn how to identify them on ultrasound and uh, look at some of the mimics, uh, which confuses us often. So the three main categories uh, for acute scrotal pain, infection, which includes epididymitis uh, and or orchitis. Uh, now, isolated orchitis is pretty much non-existent now because the cause of it used to be mumps, and mumps is pretty much non-existent thanks to the good vaccination. So most of the times it's either just epididymitis in the early stages or epididymal orchitis. Uh, we look at the complications, torsion, uh, complete and partial torsion, partial torsion which can be sometimes uh, very confusing and difficult to diagnose. Uh, we look at their complications and of course trauma. Infection and torsion uh, usually come with uh, a clinical history of a typical classic clinical history. Uh, so knowing that in advance is extremely essential to making these diagnoses. And trauma, of course, does come with that history of either a motor vehicle crash or uh, sports-related injuries, or even some uh, oddball injuries related to sexual pleasure. Uh, so those histories may be difficult to dig out from the patient, but yeah, if you are suspecting it, I suggest you do. Uh, this is a classic case of uh, an epididymitis. As you can see, uh, this is the inferior portion. That's the tail of the epididymis, which gets involved first in any case of uh, epididymitis. And if the patient presents early on, all you will see is basically this heterogeneous enlargement of the tail of the epididymis, which will be hyperemic, and the rest of the epididymis will be completely normal. So I've seen some of the, you know, the early junior residents calling it a mass also, because it does look like a mass, especially when the rest of the epididymis is normal. So again, looking at the history is extremely important. These are mostly infectious in the younger males. Gonorrhea and chlamydia are the culprits. In children and older males, E. coli is usually the culprit. So yes, this, some of the inferior portion of the testis here was also involved and uh, very heterogeneous and hyperemic. Sometimes um, comparison will be the only key. As you can see, if you see just the right epididymis here, it does not quite look very abnormal, right? It's pretty homogeneous. Um, but if you compare it with the left, there is a huge difference in the size of the epididymis and of course the vascularity. So yes, comparison, whenever God has given two sides, I suggest and highly recommend you compare it because it's free and um, it will help you a huge deal in making that diagnosis. So yes, comparison is always uh, very helpful in cases of uh, epididymitis or testicular torsion as well. Testes may or may not get involved, again, depending on what stage the patient presents. This case, uh, the testis was involved. And again, the key is in getting this comparison single field of view image of both the testes in the same view. If you do not, if sometimes the scrotum is really big and enlarged and you are not able to get it, I would suggest keeping the same parameters if you're taking two separate images because that's very crucial in determining which side is uh, hyperemic or having less vascularity. Uh, looking at some of the complications, if um, these uh, infections are not controlled early on or the patients do not present um, because, you know, some of the younger males do not want to lose their stud image and do not want to come to the ER because they think it's just a mild pain that they will get over with. So they may come with something more severe, such as, just, is, such as abscess formations. So as you can see in this grayscale image, the entire scrotum or the semi-scrotum looks abnormal. There is enlarged heterogeneous epididymis. The, the head also looks enlarged. Uh, there is some uh, complex looking fluid uh, within the scrotal cavity. The scrotal skin as well looks uh, thickened. And if you put vascularity, if you put color Doppler, you can see it's definitely very hypervascular, uh, excluding this hypervascular area, which indeed was an epididymal abscess. So look for the secondary signs of infection. Look for all these associated features, because if the patient has formed an abscess, it's very likely that he does have an advanced stage of uh, epididymitis or orchitis. 
So again, the same abscess right there. And of course, you can have testicular involvement as well. This was a pretty bad case, um, which was uh, diagnosed pretty late. The patient presented pretty late. And you can see that there was an extra testicular collection as well as an intratesticular collection. And the key thing to remember in these cases is try to keep following up these patients until they are completely resolved. You never know when they may flare up again. And as we all know, testis is a precious organ. You do not want to mess with it. So do follow up until complete resolution. Uh, I cannot stress on it anymore, but this is, this is extremely crucial in all testicular uh, diseases. Venous infarct as a result of venous thrombosis is, uh, is a very, very important complication of orchitis to know of, to be aware of, because it can mimic testicular torsion as well, because there's reduced flow in the testis. But again, how do you differentiate? How do you prevent this patient from going to the OR is look for those associated signs. If the patient has developed venous thrombosis and infarct, it's possible, it's, it's more likely that patient does have, again, advanced epididymorchitis. So as you can see here, there is complex hydrocele. There's, of course, edema of the testis and epididymis, and there is uh, thickening of the scrotal wall also. It's not very well demonstrated here, but I promise it was. So yes, there will be asymmetric decreased flow. And as you can see here, again, there's another patient which basically lost all flow in the testis and even was necrosed. So this testis was basically non-salvageable by the time um, it was brought to attention. And you can see the hypervascularity in the right side of the epididymis and testis. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little, little bit later as well. Gonadal vein thrombosis is another uh, complication. In this particular case also, the patient came and presented when he had a palpable cord. He did not present to us when he actually had epididymorchitis and um, when he had the acute onset of it. So when he did feel this palpable cord, that's when he came to the hospital thinking that this is something uh, really concerning. And uh, you'll often see the, the elongated uh, vessel, which is completely thrombosed. So, of course, you have to, uh, I would highly suggest you go in whenever a patient presents with a palpable abnormality to try to palpate it again and try to put the transducer right there to be able to identify what the problem is. Funiculitis, a lesser known complication. Funiculitis is actually inflammation of the spermatic cord, uh, and it usually occurs as a sequela of orchitis. I have a better case, this one right here, where you can see this heterogeneous appearance of the spermatic cord with increased vascularities. And patients present with focal tenderness. Again, if they do not present at the time of epididymorchitis, you can always get that history from them. Did you have pain? You know, if, did, you, did you have some fever? Did you have acute pain Which um, on that side of the scrotum? Pyocele, again, some untreated epididymorchitis can lead to dense collection, pus collection in the scrotal cavity. This patient also had intratesticular abscesses along with it, which is not surprising when it has reached that stage that he has formed a huge pus collection. He has definite hyperemia in the testis as well. So again, I would say follow up all such lesions um, until resolution. You do not want to lose that testis. Uh, this patient did need surgical evacuation because uh, the pus was way too much and did not respond to early antibiotics. So this was really an advanced stage of epididymorchitis. Granulomatous epididymorchitis is another, um, it can be tricky. And this was a case I saw not too long ago. Patient presented with acute onset pain, uh, or acute on chronic pain rather. And you can see a very heterogeneous epididymis bilaterally with more granulomatous formation right there. Not too much hypervascularity as such, but it definitely looked abnormal. And obviously, like always, patient did not come with a known history of bladder cancer or not on the requisition. And only when you think about it will you actually try to find out what's going on. And since it did not fit into any category, um, more, more uh, bread and butter cases, I did think of tuberculosis. And the patient was not from India or Turkey, had not traveled recently, 
And I looked into his charts, and of course, he had history of bladder cancer. And for those of you who do not know, bladder cancer, some of the bladder ca advanced uh, high-grade bladder cancers are treated with BCG. And so here you go. BCG led to this tuberculosis, tuberculosis epididymitis in this patient. Other causes of granulomatous epididymorchitis could be sarcoid or brucella. Another case where the epididymis was not as involved, but you had this granulomatous lesion in the testis itself with a lot of vascularity. And this patient was also uh, diagnosed with tuberculous orchitis or granulomatous orchitis. Just a little bit of increased flow compared to the left side. So always keep that in mind when you see something atypical, which is not really fitting into any of the, the bread and butter cases that you have seen. Think of tuberculosis and look for a history of bladder cancer. Focal orchitis, this particular case I remember, was initially diagnosed as a testicular neoplasm. And you all can see why. It's a very well-defined hypoechoic lesion, which is hyperemic. And somehow, I laid my hands on it, or laid my eyes on it, and I'm like, this doesn't look like neoplasm. I think this is just focal orchitis. And I had a hard time convincing my colleague uh, to change his report and say that, no, just do a follow-up initially. Um, and the reason why I said was, uh, yes, it looks like a very well-defined lesion, but look for those associated, the associated findings that I mentioned again. There's a complex, uh, complex hydrocele, there was scrotal wall thickening, and the rest of the testicular parenchyma also showed some hyperemia, as you can see here. Uh, so the, the, the referring physician actually kind of agreed because of the symptoms. And again, as I said, the clinical history will often help you. Testicular neoplasms will not always present with an acute pain. So um, this patient was followed um, and was on antibiotics. He came back after four weeks, and as you can see, it has uh, definitely showed some improvement. So always look for those findings, correlate with the clinical history. Uh, that will give you a whole deal of um, information about what's going on uh, with the testes. This is an unusual case, and I apologize. This is a very old case. I did not find any other case after uh, I see this, and it's not even my case. Uh, this was a case of seminoma, and you can see some scattered microliths. And seminoma sometimes can masquerade as orchitis. It can infiltrate and obstruct the seminiferous tubules, and that results in orchitis. And this is also one of the very important reasons why you should always follow these lesions until complete resolution. Because if, it's or if you just thought it was orchitis, gave him anti antibiotics and sent him home, he would have had some uh, very high stage in metastatic seminoma. So uh, it would have definitely progressed much more. So uh, this, this patient responded to antibiotics, the orchitis got better, and the tumor was much more visible. And um, the patient was then worked up and found to have a seminoma. Uh, one of the uh, mimics of uh, orchitis could be something of like homogeneous neoplastic infiltrative involvement, such as this. Uh, this was a case of lymphoma, and uh, more commonly for lymphoma, we expect a bilateral involvement. Uh, however, this patient did not and had a unilateral uh, homogeneous hypervascular testis, and this can be mistaken for orchitis if the patient does not have a known history of lymphoma. Moving on to the second category, torsion. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of the bell clapper deformity, which is one of the common causes for extravaginal torsion in pediatric patients. This occurs when the tunica vaginalis completely encircles the epididymis and the spermatic cord and the testis and does not attach to the scrotal wall, which would have fixed the testis in position. So when it's completely surrounding it, the testis remains like this clapper in a bell, and it's free to rotate around, and that's what which predisposes it to torsion. So uh, keep in mind this bell clapper deformity. These are two images. Uh, this is supposed to be right and left, but I somehow took both of the right side, but the left side looked the same. And you can see the fluid surrounding the entire spermatic cord, and uh, that there was not much fluid around the testis, but you could definitely see fluid around the distal spermatic cord. 
Uh, time is of extreme importance in torsion uh, if you want to save the testis. And uh, if it's diagnosed within six hours, it has a very high rate of viability or salvageability. And that is the key point. You want to make sure uh, the, test is, the torsion is diagnosed as long as the testis is viable so that they can go to surgery and detours it. So five to six hours, and particularly in the first four hours, you will see almost a normal appearing testis on grayscale as you see in this. However, there was absolutely no flow within the testis and epididymis. Patient went to surgery and was able to save the testis. So this is the, the first four hours is the most crucial. And of course, it depends on how soon the patient comes to the hospital. But uh, as, as soon as you see it, the patient needs to be sent to the OR. This, for example, uh, was still within six hours and the testis could be saved, but you can see the difference. The testis is beginning to, is beginning to become more hypoechoic. So you do not want to wait any longer in such patients. You do want to send them to the OR immediately to make them uh, to salvage the testis. More than 20, 20 hours, of course, more complications set in, and uh, this testis is completely infarcted. You see some echogenic foci, which suggests some necrosis has set in as well. There's absolutely no flow, and this clearly is a non-salvageable testis. So you do not want to wait that long. Hemorrhagic uh, complications or hemorrhagic changes in a torsion gives this marbly appearance. Again, it does suggest or is compatible with a non-salvageable testis, um, but this is not a tumor which will be easily suggested by absence of blood flow within it, but most people sit, look, you know, expect like a fluid collection within the testis. But many a times when there is hemorrhagic change in a torsion, torsion, it gives rise to this marble kind of an appearance in the testicular parenchyma. Partial torsion, now those are the tricky ones, and uh, many a times uh, people are just looking at complete absence of flow to make that diagnosis of torsion. And even if there's a little bit of flow, they're like, oh, flow is present, this is not torsion. But these are the cases which will take you to the court most of the time, and you don't want to do that. So if you see the color, you can definitely see there's decreased flow compared to the side, which is the normal side on the left. And if you do compare the waveforms, which in this case, I, you don't really need to, uh, this is a very normal waveform compared to this, which is more like a tortoise parvus, very low amplitude, low velocity waveform. So this is very highly suggestive of a partial testicular torsion. These definitely need to go to the OR because these are salvageable testes, definitely. And you do not want to wait longer because if it has torsed partially one time, very high likelihood that it's going to torse an infarct. So some of the color flow patterns that we do need to identify in torsion, of course, absent flow is a no-brainer. Increased resistive index on the affected side, which you can see uh, sometimes because of increased edema, diminished or reversed diastolic flow, and decreased flow velocity, as, as you can see here. Another case in a 16-year-old kid who presented with acute pain. This is the left side, which was completely normal, nice normal waveform. On the right side, as you can see, it was difficult to obtain any diastolic flow, and at one point we saw reversal of diastolic flow. This corresponded to patient symptoms on this side, and this was diagnosed as torsion, partial torsion, taken to surgery, I found a 360-degree torsion, salvageable testis. Uh, another example, again, and this testis had begun to show some heterogeneity, but still had some flow, and I can see some people may just call it normal testis without looking at the waveform that this is completely abnormal. This is not what you expect in a testis, reversal of diastolic flow. Not once, but twice, and many more incidences that we got. So yes, these, these testis do need to go to the OR immediately because these are, these are partial torsed testis. And if you're not sure, many a times you may be lucky if you go just superior to the testis and look for the spermatic cord twist, which is also called the whirlpool sign. It's been described in several other twisted pathologic conditions across the body. So it's a very useful sign to keep in mind. And this one is again associated with decreased flow, but still some presence of flow in the testis. Decreased right-sided pain, go above the testis, and voila, you see this nice whirlpool. So the testis is still salvageable. They detorsed it manually right there, 
and you can see the flow coming back in the right testers. This study in 2014 found 100% specificity and sensitivity for torsion. So torsion is not necessarily an all or nothing occurrence and may be partial or transient. So do look for that abnormal flow. As I said earlier also, comparison is the key in scrotal ultrasound. Bilateral torsion, I haven't seen yet. If you do, please let me know. Um, partial torsion does present a diagnostic challenge. So look for the asymmetric flow. I've seen or heard of a lot of uh, radiologists going to the court because, missing, uh, because of missing a partial torsion. Uh, sonographic findings may vary depending on the degree and duration of torsion, uh, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, ask for the history when exactly the symptoms started, and spectral Doppler can be helpful in making the correct diagnosis as well. Undescended testis, we all know that's also a predisposing factor for cryptorchidism, so don't just forget about it when you do not see the testis. Try to find the testis, especially if the patient has pain. And lo and behold, this testis was in the uh, superior part of the inguinal canal and looked very different than this normal testis. No internal flow, this testis had torsed and infarcted and necrosed, so it was clearly non-salvageable. Torsion detorsion, this uh, remains somewhat of a confusing entity, and this again leads to an asymmetric flow, but I would say the history is the most helpful in such cases. Uh, you should look for a history of intermittent pain and relief over past several days. This patient in particular presented with pain for two hours, but by the time he came to the ultrasound suite, he said, oh, I'm feeling good, and the symptoms were on the left side. So you can see the left side is actually more vascular than the right side, and you may argue, well, I will call it epididymal architis. Well, again, if you look at the history, it's, it's pretty classic for a torsion detorsion. And again, if, as I mentioned in the first section, you have to look for associated findings. If there is orchitis, look at epididymitis, because isolated orchitis is pretty much non-existent. So if it is orchitis, you will have an abnormal epididymis, you will have a complex hydrocele, you may have a scrotal wall thickening, and patients will present with a very classic history of acute onset pain with fever. Uh, this was another very interesting case. Um, the urologist was very smart, and uh, he was pretty sure this is gonna be a torsion. Uh, decreased flow on the right side, there was a whirlpool, and the urologist, as soon as he saw it, he detorsed it right there in front of us, and he asked us to image it, and of course, there is a lot of flow. So this is all reactive hyperemia uh, after the patient, uh, after the urologist detorsed his testis. I haven't personally tried detorsing it in, in absence of a urologist. I don't know if anybody would be courageous enough to do it, but I don't think it's a bad idea. <laughs> um, if there is, if you suspect that there's gonna be a huge time interval between, uh, between the scanning and the patient going to the OR. But yes, I would definitely pick up the phone immediately and call the urologist. Um, many a times, again, if the diagnosis is missed, either by a radiologist or, as I said, if the patient does not present, because these symptoms can be even more, um, make, may make the patient even more reluctant to come to uh, the hospital. He gets intermittent pain and gets relief, so he keeps waiting for that symptom to get relief. But in the meantime, the testes can get infarcted. And this was one such case when the patient did decide to come to the hospital one time uh, during an acute onset of pain, and we saw that half of his testes had infarcted. So uh, uh, the patient was taken to surgery. He had a 360-degree torsion at that time and uh, underwent an orchopexy and debridement of this portion. Let's look at some of the mimics. Uh, torsed appendages, which could be testicular appendages or epididymal appendages. These are basically just useless remnants. These are Mullerian duct remnants, uh, which just hang out as protrusions from the testis and epididymis. And most of the times they will do nothing. But occasionally they will torse and will cause an acute onset pain, mimicking the pain related to acute testicular torsion. So, of course, the ultrasound will be able to differentiate it very easily. You will see flow within the testis and epididymis, and alongside, you will see this elliptical shape uh, structure arising from either the testis or epididymis without flow. And 
classically, they have this blue dot sign. So again, I encourage you to go inside the room and you know, test where the patient is tender and right, put your probe right there. Um, if you don't treat them, they're usually managed conservatively. They do not go to the OR. They will usually just torse and fall off and then remain in the scrotal cavity as scrotal pearls. So that's what they are if somebody doesn't know. Um, this was one of a kind case. A uh, patient presented with, again, acute onset pain, thinking of acute testicular torsion. The testicular flow was normal, but he had this huge cyst. And if you don't think of it, you will probably not diagnose it and thinking, oh, patient just overreacted or whatever. But this is a huge cyst, and it is very possible that this can torse. So this was a paratesticular cyst which had actually torsed, and he was extremely tender at this side. So point of tenderness, you know, compare it with ultrasound, and then put all the things together, and you will often come to a diagnosis. The patient was sent to the OR in time and um, was correctly treated. Torus epididymal cyst, again, it can be even more difficult to diagnose because we are so used to seeing large epididymal cysts, and we never really think of them being torsed. But yes, if the patient is really tender, why would an epididymal cyst by itself give patient tenderness? It shouldn't, right? So think of these out-of-the-box diagnoses. Uh, don't overdiagnose. Um, don't start calling all epididymal cysts as tors. But yes, when the patient is in pain and has presented classically, uh, do think of these diagnoses. One of these cases, this confused me a lot. This was a typical 5 p.m. case. A uh, patient presented with pain. One of my sonographers, one of my very good sonographers, was scanning it and said, oh, this is testicular torsion. I go into the room. Of course, there is no flow in the testis. How many people would call it torsion? Comes to the ER, nobody calls it torsion. Really? Am I the only one here? <laughs> OK. Well, I was thinking of torsion until I asked, I talked to the patient. And I said, OK, can you point it out to me? Like, are you tender here? And he was very comfortable while we were scanning him. He said, no, I'm not really tender there. I'm tender in the inguinal canal area. And we scanned it, and it looked like a blob there, like cystic area, some soft tissue. We couldn't really put things together. I mean, incarcerated inguinal hernia, but really, how many times have you seen causing testicular ischemia? Patient did go to the OR, and uh, yes, he indeed had an incarcerated inguinal hernia, and they reduced it, and the flow was returned. Um, I looked up literature after that because I felt terrible. I was like, really? Did I not know of this? And there was just one case report which caused testicular ischemia because of this. I mean, it's an artery after all. I mean, it's very difficult to occlude an artery because of a hernia. But it was the case. Another mimic, a very dangerous one, that too. Um, this was a very famous case by Dr. Dogra. This was a patient from Saudi Arabia who presented with pain, no flow, flow present, call it torsion, sent to the OR, got an orchectomy, but found to have lupus vasculitis. I said, okay, you know, we couldn't diagnose. He came back again after a few days and had the same appearance on the other side. And of course, this time we were smarter. We said, no, this is lupus, this is not torsion. Unfortunately, he infarcted, developed infection, and hematoma, he lost that testis too. And he changed his mind and decided to sue us. And of course, it was a multi-million dollar uh, deal. So I always say, don't mess with an Arab. It's, it'll put you in trouble. <laughs> Another complication that I saw, this happens when you know, liver transplant surgeons decide to do hernia surgeries. And this was one of the liver transplant surgeons who, who was doing hernia surgeries. And he, he, it, was, it was supposed to be a simple surgery, but no, he tied it too, stra too tight and patient infarcted his testis just because of a simple hernia repair complication. So be aware of these complications. Um, venous infarct, I already talked about, it can mimic um, torsion because of reduced flow or absence flow. But if you look at the associated findings, you may be able to diagnose it that this is in fact a sequela of orchitis. Uh, acute extrinsic compression uh, by a fluid collection can also lead to decreased flow or abnormal flow, as you can see here. Um, this was the right side, this is the normal left side, and this was an acutely developed uh, hydrocele. Post-hydrocelectomy, return of flow. 
So this is something like a page kidney or a compartment syndrome kind of uh, appearance. Quickly uh, run through trauma as I have two minutes. Um, again, the, the role of radiologists in trauma is to tell if the patient needs to go to surgery or not, right? right? So you have to find out if the test is intact or not, because if there is testicular rupture, he needs to go to the OR. Um, one of the most common findings, however, in trauma is a hematocele. But hematocele can occur even without testicular injury, and that may make things difficult looking at the testis, but uh, especially when the hematocele is that big. So always try to look for the testicular tunica albuginea and the continuity of it. If it is disrupted, most likely it is going to be a rupture. This was a case of an MVC. The first time he presented, it looked somewhat abnormal, heterogeneous, but did not show any acute uh, discrete lesions. But patient came for follow-up, so that's why another follow-up is always necessary in these trauma cases. And he developed more discrete hematomas. So these were only contusions at this time, which became more discrete hematomas. Uh, Sports-related injury, uh, intratesticular hematoma. Again, very, very important to follow up all these lesions until resolution because they may get infected and you may land up losing the testis. So any intratesticular lesion that you do not uh, intend to take out, you have to follow them to complete resolution. You may get trauma-induced torsion in a rare number of cases. That's because of the contraction of the cremastric muscles. And sometimes you may see a nice fracture line, often associated with a rupture, as you can see here. There's disruption of the tunica albuginea with contour abnormality, a lot of hematocele as well. Needs to go to the OR. Okay, uh, that was a gross um, image uh, from the surgery. He was able to save some of his testes. Again, a sports-related injury, rupture of the testis, but part of the testis here is viable, as you can see, with color Doppler. So again, you can debride this part of the testis, and that's the role of color Doppler, to tell the surgeon that, okay, you do um, have some viable testis. Bilateral rupture just suggests a very severe grade of injury, and this is just another example of bilateral trauma with complete loss of this testis, and he landed up losing both the testes because of bad ruptures. These are some scrotal wall hematomas. Again, resolution is extremely important. They landed up becoming abscesses, and uh, uh, that's not good. It was still in the scrotal wall, so at least he did not lose his testes. Spermatic cord hematoma can be seen with trauma, can be seen with hernia repairs, and can be managed conservatively if it's causing symptoms needs to be taken to surgery. And if it's not treated, may result in abscess. Just another penetrating trauma. These could be a little more devastating. Uh, a lot of uh, a testicular rupture there, and there's a large hematocele. So I'm going to stop here since we're running out of time. Um, spontaneous testicular hemorrhage, I do want to just say uh, a few things about it. Uh, this is not very well described in literature. It's just a few case reports, and it's often misdiagnosed as a neoplasm which has hemorrhaged. Uh, this is a rare entity. Uh, patients do not have any history of trauma, and if you do need a high index of suspicion for this because there's no real sonographic finding to tell you that this is spontaneous testicular hemorrhage.